So this is, this is going to be a very well-organized moderated session since I just met my co-moderator here. Um, <laughs> but for those of you who don't know me, I'm Eleanor Carlson. I'm um, piloting this 200 mammals project, which after Harris's talk feels incredibly small. I'm thinking I may need to scale up by several orders of magnitude. And do you want to say something? Um, sure. My name is uh, Sophie Salama. I'm at UC Santa Cruz and work on a variety of comparative genomics projects there. And really excited to be here. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and I'm at the, the UMass Medical School and the Broad Institute. I forgot that part. But our first speaker here is uh, Eric Jarvis, who is a professor at the Rockefeller, uh, Rockefeller University. He got his start, I believe, in the neurobiology of vocal learning. At some point in time, got frustrated with the quality of his bird genomes. And then, and you'll have to tell me how this happened at some point in time, somehow ended up being the fearless leader of the Vertebrate Genomics Project. And I don't know totally all the details, but it's an incredible project that's really trying to get these, these high contiguity, high quality genomes for a bunch of vertebrate species, and it's going to empower a lot of science that's coming up in the next few years. So, and Eric, I'll let you go. Well, I'm just going to add that Eric is a tremendous dancer, and so I think we should have an interpretive uh, chromosome <laughs> movement <laughs> thing at some point. I'm going to get Harris at the stage with that animation. So. <laughs> All right, well, thank you for that introduction. And uh, yes, yeah, so I'm going to get into the neurobiology of dance at some point in the near future and the genomics of it. Uh, <clears throat> so, is this going to project up? Okay. okay. So, uh, how did I uh, actually, oh, thank you. How did I actually um, get involved in uh, helping to lead the Vertebrate Genomes Project and project of the G10K mission? Steve O'Brien over there asked me to. And he made it hard, a hard offer that was uh, to refuse. Okay, good. I don't think he can see you there. While we're getting that set up, I'll go ahead and get started to tell you some of the background story here. Uh, yes, my, my uh, uh, area of research is understanding brain function, in particular the, uh, how the brain controls uh, vocal learning as a model for uh, spoken language. And there are certain animals out there that can actually imitate sounds like we do, like songbirds and parrots. And so. Uh, I have always been interested, as many people here in the room know, and I've over the years talked to, been interested in uh, the genetics of that trait, the genetics of language, uh, and, uh, and doing it from a comparative approach, you know, comparing genomes across many species, those who have it, those who don't, like humans and chimps. And when you start comparing these genomes and you're coming up with the interesting candidate genes and the students in your lab start to study them, you begin to uh, discover that uh, the assemblies aren't quite accurate. Uh, and so, therefore, uh, since they're not accurate, the students spend six months, sometimes a year, trying to clone the accurate uh, structures of the genes. And then imagine it's not just one species, but it's five or six or ten species you're comparing. And so you got to PCR out this gene in ten species. And then you discover, wait a minute, your trait's controlled by 50 genes. So you got to PCR out 50 genes from ten species to actually uh, get the uh, right candidate genes, and that got me frustrated, and that's how I got involved in, in uh, trying to uh, deal with and help uh, foster high-quality genome assemblies. Okay, so, uh, uh, and be because, you know, although I'm focused on the brain and species that can learn how to imitate sounds, which is a small piece of that 1.5 million species that Harris talked about, uh, and thank you, Harris, for the shout-out. Uh, the <clears throat> what we're learning uh, in terms of trying to generate high quality assemblies is useful for all of biology. So Eleanor asked that I talk about something that's relevant to all of biology, and even though we'll talk about vertebrates, uh, DNA is DNA to a certain degree. So <clears throat> uh, to get right to the chase, in case uh, I didn't have time to cover everything, so I had to already define upfront what this particular session is about. What is a reference genome, and uh, what I and other people consider a reference genome, at least an aspired reference genome, that we may not be able to achieve at this point in time, is a, a genome assembly that is complete, zero gaps, all right, that is accurate in all its nucleotide calls, base calls, and also uh, genome structure, and that is representative of the species, uh, which means more than one individual sequence. All right. So, uh, <clears throat> How can we get there? And uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about, about the trajectory that um, I've been taking. I was in first involved in a large-scale genome project called the Avian Phylogenomics Project, uh, wh which in collaboration with BGI and many others in G10K, uh, we had produced genomes of, of around 48 bird species, uh, mostly with short reads, that led to a series of publications, many up here, 
uh, that help advance uh, biology, including my favorite questions on vocal learning or the uh, family tree uh, for birds. But here is where, uh, after we had these genomes, my students started to study some of these genes functionally, and we had lots of problems. Uh, <clears throat> and around this time, uh, Steve asked me to take on uh, help with the leadership of the G10K project, which led to this vertebrate genomes project uh, in collaboration with uh, the B10K bird group, the BAT1K, and Earth Biogenome group, whose mission it is to produce uh, high quality genome assemblies of all different vertebrate species, all 66,000, uh, in different phases, like phase one for all orders and then families and so on. And here, to say this verbatim, the goal of the Vertebrate Genomes Project is to generate at least one high quality, error free, near gapless, chromosomal level, haplotype phased, and annotated reference genome for all extent vertebrate species, and to utilize those genomes. Uh, to address fundamental qu questions in biology, disease, and conservation, uh, so that my students don't have to suffer, all right, uh, with uh, poor assembled genes. And neither does the rest of the community. Uh, and <clears throat> we decided to take this not just, uh, uh, as some people say, stamp collecting genomes, but with a particular question in mind uh, for phase one, all orders. We're using uh, this f family tree of birds that we generated at genome scale and other trees generated with nuclear DNA for mammals. We found that what most people consider orders of animals have some common ancestor that dates back to the time of the dinosaur extinction, the last mass extinction. And so we use that criterion to select out uh, species. And, and we go from 150 so-called orders to 260 by using this criterion. And we believe once we have all these 260 species sequenced uh, at high quality reference level, we will be able to use them to learn something about the last mass extinction, who survived, who didn't, what kind of genomes they had uh, using uh, ancestral inference to help us inform uh, what's going on with the current mass extinction induced by humans, the sixth mass extinction. And uh, to cut to the chase, because we've done a lot of work on 14 species you heard Harris talk about, and we have many more that we're about to announce in a few weeks. Um, and the two biggest take-home lessons learned in trying to create these high-quality reference genomes is that read lengths need to be longer than the actual repeats in the genome to get a good quality assembly, and particularly within the same haplotype. And the other is that haplotypes is what just one giant repeat. Okay, the maternal and paternal chromosomes. And that causes a big problem, bigger than many of us realize, uh, for generating these high quality assemblies. And now to show you some of the data, uh, <clears throat> we start out with uh, two different bird species, some of my favorites, vocal learners. So this is what happens when you ask someone to help lead this effort, you take vocal learning species, a hummingbird and a zebra finch. Uh, the zebra finch, fortunately, there was a prior Sanger based reference. And, uh, we convince ourselves and a lot of companies to apply their favorite technologies uh, to one or both of these individuals here. And so you have one animal with all these different technologies applied to it for the actual sequencing or scaffolding approaches, short reads versus long reads, long range information here. Many of you know about these. And uh, <clears throat> we did a lot of different assembly comparisons uh, with different algorithms. And the first lesson up in this quadrant here, this is the NG50 or really the N50 contig value, continuous sequence without gaps. And the first lesson you learn, no matter what method we tried, what algorithm we tried, long reads always gave you a lot more contiguity than the short reads here. Uh, and we really beat this to death because a lot of people, a lot of companies were pr promising that the short reads could get us there. It just never has. And anybody who has is going to get a Nobel Prize, I think, who can figure that out. Um, <clears throat> The second lesson we learned here is all the scaffolding tools that you know, try to link these contigs together into chromosomes, they, don't, they, don't, they do a lot, but the long reads versus short reads doesn't make a difference there. What really makes a difference is the range of the scaffold links. With high c uh, 3D chromosome interaction maps, uh, giving you the longest scaffolds that are chromosomal length, here matching the sizes of what we see in the hummingbird uh, karyotype. So, <clears throat> Uh, second lesson I told you about already, about the uh, phasing. Uh, here with work I did with uh, Jonas Korlick, we found that whether it's long read assemblies or short reads, Sanger based or whatever, if you don't phase your haplotypes, you get errors. 
And in this case, uh, this is an interesting gene called DSP1. It's regulated by singing behavior in the white signal here, the mRNA product, in the song learning nuclei of, of, song, of all vocal learning species that we've looked at, but not by movement behavior in the surrounding motor pathway. So there's something that mutated in the regulatory region of this gene that allowed it to be regulated in speech-like areas of these birds that we don't see in a chicken or, or we don't think we'll see in a, in a monkey. And so we have been trying to take the Sanger base or other assemblies and study this region, and we find there's a bunch of repeat sequences in the promoter region that we think is cause responsible for this specialized regulation in these speech-like areas. And we really had a hard time assembling or uh, putting this together from the, uh, any of the assemblies of those 48 species. And we found that once you start to phase the haplotypes in your assembly, that these repeats were accidentally strung together as one haplotype where they really belong to different types of repeats in each haplotype. And the assemblers just had a hard time distinguishing repeats that are actual real repeats and repeats that are actually divergent haplotypes. And once we did that, then we were getting the accurate regulatory region structure for the specialized regulation of this gene. And so <clears throat> I like to look at this as a puzzle. Here is a puzzle. And you break down the genome in many pieces. If you have short pieces, it's hard to fill in some of these gaps. Or it repeats like one wing versus the other wing. You can't, make, you can't decide if this should go with the left wing or the right wing. All right? Uh, but with long reads, this makes it easier. But it's not just long reads, you need to do that twice for diploid genomes. And once you do that, then you start to get more accurate assemblies. Um, so these two have been key in the last four years in the lessons that we've learned. Uh, in that time period, as, um, uh, uh, as you heard uh, uh, you know, in the previous talk, the VGP group came up with a uh, set of metrics uh, that tried to uh, define what kind of metrics do we need to do the biology that we want to do so my students don't have to clone the genes over again. You need about an N50 contig uh, using this uh, uh, metric uh, equation here, an N50 contig that's 1 million base pairs or, or bigger, an N50 scaffold that is 10 million base pairs or bigger, at least two pieces of evidence to uh, identify whether your st gene structures are correct in chromosomes, and a QV value of 40 or greater uh, for the base call, meaning no more than one error in every 10,000 base pairs. Uh, we have not put a phasing metric in that equation yet, but with these 14 genomes that uh, we sequenced in the past year, we're learning about actually m more metrics that we need to quantify to get these genomes to be high quality. And this is a table that we're putting together for an assembly paper that Arang Ray and others are preparing within the VGP G10K assembly group. And we're coming up with six quality control categories of, of continuity, correctness in the base calls, as well as in, in the accuracy of the base calls, correctness in the actual uh, organization and the structure, phasing uh, metrics, as well as uh, functional completeness, like with Busco gene scores that are uh, known uh, functionally relevant genes across vertebrates in or um, all organisms, and chromosomes, what, whether they be assigned to autosomes or sex chromosomes and mitochondrial genomes. It's a long table. I don't have much time to talk, but uh, we might be even going beyond the metric that we call the VGP metric that lots of people are using, 14 quality metrics, and four different genome assembly quality levels, from draft to reference uh, to high quality reference to the perfect genome, which I started out in the first slide. We're not there yet. The only place where, where we are, we think, with perfect genomes is like mitochondria or bacteria, uh, where you can actually sequence long reads through a single mitochondrial sequence now, that uh, is what we're finding in these vertebrate sequences. But to get to the near perfect, uh, or getting close to it, I won't say even near perfect, but, but much, the best we can get right now is not taking one single technology, but is combining multiple technologies together. In this case, long reads uh, to get your initial contigs, then 10x linked reads to scaffold them together into initial scaffolds, followed by longer range bio nano optical maps to go further, and then finally high C to get arm to arm chromosomal length scaffolds. Um, and once you get that, you can use these high C maps uh, shown here. Some of you have seen these juice plots where uh, before curation or after manual curation, uh, you can see one box here represents uh, 
the high sea weeds mat to one scaffold. And if you don't see any other scaffolds uh, uh, mapping to your scaffold here, uh, to the right plot here, is it your right? Yes, okay. Uh, what that means is that this is a arm-to-arm -arm chromosome with no other scaffolds matching to it. Even though there is gaps in there, okay, it's an assembled, complete, what we think represents a chromosome. And this is how we're now defining chromosomes. Uh, there's some debate whether we should call these chromosomes or not, but they're chromosomal level scaffolds uh, that we can actually uh, uh, identify in this way that fish karyotyping mapping does similarly. And so, uh, <clears throat> With that, we've noticed that with the high C mapping for the zebra finch genome, uh, what the fish mapping said was chromosome 1 and 1B, uh, the high C mapping is saying that they actually belong together as one chromosome. And instead of having 35 chromosomes, we narrowed it down to 33 chromosomes in the zebra finch. So here is the Sanger base reference that most of the scientific community uses. 35 chromosomes in the new VGP assembly, 33. Uh, the gaps per chromosome range from 33 to 7,000 gaps per chromosome. We're now down to one gap across the centromere to 25 gaps per chromosome. Uh, unassigned scaffolds, that is not assigned to chromosomes, the previous assembly is 35,000 of them. We now have 101 of them. Some of them we think actually artificial haplotype duplications. Uh, the gaps, uh, any, the unassigned scaffold, 22,000 of them before, we have 115 left, and so on. So uh, we're not at that perfect reference that I told about in the beginning, but we're getting there. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, what's causing us from preventing us getting there? There are two things, and here's one of them. Uh, here is the, uh, what we call the primary contig or haplotype in black, and the alternative haplotype in uh, blue. And then this line here, this gray line, is the level of heterozygosity, the divergence between the two haplotypes. We find that the the black and the blue get closer to the true value in, in uh, this blue line here, the higher the heterozygosity. In this case, having high heterozygosity is good because it means you can figure out who's mom and who's dad. They're different, okay? If mom and dad are so similar, it's really hard to figure out who's who in, in the child. Uh, but sometimes uh, this heterozygosity causes the assemblers to get confused where um, where this alternative haplotype is really not, is, is strung together on the, on mom and dad are basically brought together where they should be separated. That's basically what should happen here. Uh, and so the assemblers, we have to retool them not only to handle haplotypes, but try to figure out when the divergence between two sequences is a haplotype divergence, when it's a real repeat divergence, right? Okay, so uh, by the way, 99% 99, 99 of these haplotype duplications in an assembly have a gap between them. And roughly half, up to half of all gaps in the prior assemblies we're discovering as a result of these haplotype issues. Right? So, uh, <clears throat> and then the repeats themselves, the, not the haplotype repeats, but the real repeats within a haplotype uh, the bigger number of uh, repetitive elements in a genome, in the light blue here, the harder it is to get uh, the contiguity we need uh, for these assemblies in black here. And then there's some of the oddball genomes where they have chimeric uh, DNA in, this, in marmoset genomes, or the platypus has 10 sex chromosomes as opposed to two, uh, and that, that's crazy. Lamprey genome, it, uh, for those who don't know, the lamprey genome, it undergoes somatic recombination. So it, it cuts up the genome, pastes things back together so different cells have different genomes in them. I mean, that's crazy. And so, <laughs> so uh, these are hard problems, which I think we can crack. All right, I would say the best assembly approach we're, get, we're, we're coming out there with now, uh, coming from Adam Philippi's group with the Rong Ray and Sergey Curran, is what we're calling a trio approach where you take mom and dad here, in the case of the zebra finch, and you sequence short reads of both of them, and you uh, then use those short reads to separate out the long reads of the child, and you assemble then those two haplotypes as two independent genomes. Uh, and there, you're actually reducing this haplotype repeat issue uh, by quite a bit in improving the assembly quality. And here's some examples on a zebra finch and a zebra fish. Um, and here are some Busco uh, genes um, scored. We're getting 93% Busco scores identified 
on the non-trio long read assembly, uh, 5 percent gene duplication, right? When we actually do a trio-based assembly, that 5 percent gene duplication goes down to 1.4 percent, meaning that was artificial haplotype duplications, all right? Many people publishing papers of gene family expansions that should not be, all right? Uh, and the zebrafish, it has the zebrafish genomes are highly repetitive. 20% uh, visco gene duplication down to 3.5% with a trio based assembly in collaboration with the Sanger team. And so uh, <clears throat> uh, we're looking into now also false gene losses uh, with the group in Korea. Uh, we don't, I don't have lots of results to show you today. I'm just showing you that there are eight types of false gene losses that we're finding in the old assembly versus the new, like the gene totally not there, split between two exons, or uh, false. Uh, coding sequence in the middle or stop codons and so forth. And uh, we're seeing these uh, corrected as well. Not that the new genome assemblies are really good, the best in the world, but they're corrected. What about your transcriptome? If you're doing RNA-seq, epigenetic uh, studies on histone acetylation, transcriptome sequencing? Well, <clears throat> uh, mapping back to the zebrafinch genome, we're getting half of our reads mapping back to well-annotated, well-structurally organized genes. Uh, here in, in uh, Green is everything that's unassigned. With the new assemblies, this is what it looks like. Almost 90 percent of our transcriptome data mapping back to the assemblies now. And so uh, to end off with here, what is a reference genome? Uh, and our aspired reference is, yes, complete, no gaps. For some of these bird genomes, we're down to one gap. That's great. Uh, accurate uh, base calls, uh, these long reads have some errors in them. Uh, uh, we're figuring out ways to fix them. Uh, and uh, the structure is now more accurate. And what, what about being representative of species? Well, this is still expensive to generate these high-quality genomes, but at least with the vertebrate genomes model approach, we're generating haplotype assemblies. So we're at least getting two individuals represented in these two green lines here. And for the zebra finch, we have already seen between haplotypes big giant insertions in one haplotype versus the other, and in big inversions in one haplotype versus the other, not just SNPs. And so, um, we're already having two different representatives here that are representing the species. And this VGP effort in collaboration with the EBP and others uh, is, is a group of people of over 200 participants now. And here I'm just giving credit to the assembly group, but I don't have time to go through all the names. I'll leave this slide up here, but a number of them are sitting in this room. And I want to thank Steve and Harris and others for inviting me to be uh, into the G10K group and to actually uh, come here and talk for, uh, where's Taylor in? Yes, okay, and thank you for uh, also all the advice you've given us on comparative genomics, and thank you for inviting me here. I'll stop. All right, thank you, Eric. Because we're uh, behind schedule, I think we're going to um, uh, uh, table questions till we have the, um, the discussion section.